Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really, really excited for this session. And I know it's the, I am the only thing between you and some nice cold beers at the end of the day. So I'm going to try my best to entertain you, but you let me know at the end. You be the judge. So this is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Pod Security. I have gone through the galaxies of pod security and condensed all the learnings I've had into one little guidebook. Take you through, oops, we're going to take you through that guidebook. And I have a couple of goals for you in the next 35 minutes. We're going to learn together. So my hope is that everybody leave this session. You go back to your lives and you turn on pod security in your clusters and you report back if my learnings actually helped you with your journey to pod security. But I would love to see more secure Kubernetes clusters out there. So what you're going to learn today is how to use some features in Kubernetes to achieve that. So I hope, hold me to this and let me know at the end that you'll feel comfortable going back and turning this on. If you don't, please ask me for more. I'm happy to give it to you. So our journey today has a few pit stops. And hopefully, do we have any Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans in the room? I'll make a few puns. I'll make a few puns. So you see the emojis up there. There's already a few. And I, I should have brought my hand towel up on the stage as well, but I forgot it. We're going to go over the pod security concepts. We're going to see it in action. I have recorded demos. I'm not cool enough to do them live because I've seen the internet here today. But you're going to be able to see them after the fact. <laughs> And you're going to be able to take them with you. And then I'm going to share some next steps, how to turn it on, how to get comfortable, and how to use it in your environment and be successful with it. So we will go through all this and more, but I guess you want to know who you're talking to, uh, who's talking to you about this. My name is Lockie Evenson, Lachlan Evenson. I listen to both. You can call me Hey Mate or whatever. I'm a product manager at Azure on the upstream team where we work in cloud native ecosystem tooling to help make folks successful in the community. You'll see me around. Uh, in this space, I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm on the governing board. I've served on Kubernetes steering. I built a Kubernetes release that hopefully didn't ruin your life. 1.16, if it did, please give me that feedback. I love travel, language, hiking, and experiencing different cultures. I'd like to learn seven languages while I'm here on Earth. I know three currently, if you don't count Australian and English as two different languages. <laughs> OK, good. Now you know who's talking to you. We can get on with it. Thank you very much. OK, so let's get into the concepts. Let's get into uh, what we're here to talk about. Before I get into all the details, I want to go over what is pod security. And you might have heard pod security or pod security administration. Pod security is a built-in, so I have everything bolded. Admission controller, it is built in. You don't need any extra software to run this. It is there, and you can use it in Kubernetes today. What does it do? It evaluates pod specifications against a predefined set of pod security standards. Don't worry about that. I'll tell you exactly what they are, but they're super important. They are applied at the namespace level. So you apply policy to each namespace you would like pod security to apply to. And they are action when pods are created in those namespaces. It is currently in beta or beta for you Americans. And uh, as of Kubernetes 1.23, which is now not the current release, the one behind. So we're on release in, and it is planned, if you all give it a thumbs up after this, to go to stable in 1.25, which is the next release. I've got some links down there. Just follow along here. I'll post the deck later so you can grab the links and whatnot. Excellent. Why? I think it's important to say, why am I telling you about this? Why would you, I want to know this. So what we want to do, again, is level up the security of your Kubernetes clusters and the workloads specifically that are running on them. So the pod, uh, this provides policy standards to restrict pod privileges. Why would we want to restrict pod privileges? To make our workloads more secure. If they are ever compromised, we're reducing the surface area of attacks and therefore making your cluster more secure by doing so as well. They are simple and easy to use. That was written on the cap for this feature. They have to be super, super simple. Hopefully, I can illustrate that they are indeed super simple. Uh, predefined, so you don't have to go make up some magic standards. 
There is a set that already exists, and you simply can refer to them by name. It supports and encourages Kubernetes security best practices. So if you use these, you will be in line with pod security best practices out of the box. You don't have to do much. And it performs validation only. We'll cover this a little bit later, but you might be thinking, can I change resources? The answer is you cannot. Uh, and we'll talk about some different options for doing that. What about the elephant in the room, or maybe the fish in the room, the babble fish in the room? Uh, what about pod security policy? You may have heard of this or have used it and been terribly disappointed when you heard it was deprecated. It is going to be removed in Kubernetes 1.25, so if you're still using it today, don't worry, I'm going to go over how you can migrate to this so that you won't be broken in the next release. The difference is, however, it does not have feature parity with pod security policy. So there are some gotchas which I would call out. Specifically, it does not support mutation. And mutation is the ability to change Kubernetes resources server side when you're creating them. OK. Moving right along here, I'm going to cover the migration story. So if you're in this path, I'm not going to go into terrible detail, but there is a migration plan. It is well documented on the Kubernetes docs. So you can go from pod security policy today, which is deprecated and being removed in three months, four months, to pod security, which we're talking about today. There is a link to do it. There is a, a well-defined process of how to do it. And hopefully, if you follow along, I know a lot of time and effort has gone into that. If you're in that situation, you should be OK. OK, everybody following along so fast? So far, cool. So far, OK, excellent. Other secret, uh, other similar ecosystem tooling. So I'd be remiss to mention that there is an ecosystem of tooling out there. You may have heard of some of these different tools. But pod security is designed to provide a built-in set of capabilities that include the security of your workloads. It's not supposed to be the only thing. So it's complementary and composable, that last point. So there are other projects out there. If you want to do more complex things, I'm going to name two. They're on the screen there, Kiverno and Gatekeeper. If you're interested in more complex pod security use cases, uh, pod security uh, use cases, and uh, this is designed to be composable. So this is complementary. You can use this and others as well. And, ag and again, these aren't all of them. I just list two there uh, for the interest of showing you some others. All right, now we're going to get into the elements of, of uh, pod security. We have a built-in admission controller. Uh, it may be run as a standalone webhook. So if you are running earlier versions than the version this became beta in, which was 1.22, you can actually deploy this in earlier versions using a webhook admission controller. Won't go into the details. You just need to know that, that exists. There are three different, security, uh, three different policy levels known as pod security standards that range from permissive, which means you can do everything, to restrictive, which means it mo removes all the things that you shouldn't be doing that are known to be uh, areas that cause security threats. The policies are applied with a specific mode per namespace. We'll go into these modes. And you can apply multiple modes to a namespace. That'll be critical. We'll go over that as well with different policy levels. And we'll go over why you might want to do that at the same time. They're the elements you need to know. Lost the monitor. And we're back. That was very dramatic. <laughs> I didn't record that. This isn't recorded that I know of. OK, so let's take a look at the uh, pod security standards. These are the levels that you will be using. Um, and they are predefined levels. Privilege, which is open and unrestricted, as I mentioned. Baseline, this covers the known privilege escalations while minimizing restrictions. So this is where you want to get to for a start. If you have nothing and have never looked at this before, the goal state you want to get to is baseline for starters. And then restricted is the highly restricted. If you have really high security interests, this takes out the most uh, security-prone pieces of pod uh, specification and make sure uh, that you're in the most restricted mode. But be warned, it may cause compatibility issues. So it's up to you to decide. I think a great goal would be that every Kubernetes cluster and every namespace has baseline pod security standards applied to them. I think that would be a cool goal to have. OK, but what about these specific standards? What are 
in these standards. So they are well documented. The link is down the bottom. I'm not going to go over every piece of the pod specification that is indeed restricted by these uh, different pod security standards. But here is some example of different fields. So spec.securitycontest.sys calls, spec.host network, they are covered. There is a, a wide range of uh, different pieces of the spot, pod specification that are defined in that link down the bottom. So too many to list, but you can go and have a look at the different pieces and I'll show you them in action. So don't worry about writing them down. Again, applied per namespace, um, which allows you to have granular or different levels, different levels of security standards. Uh, based on your needs per namespace. You may not want to apply restricted to cube system namespace, for example, but you may want to do it to your default uh, workload uh, namespace. Okay, elements of uh, pod security. So these things are uh, applied in a specific mode, and there are three different modes, and they can be set on a namespace, and you can have different policy levels per namespace as well. The three modes are enforce, which says, I will not allow this, it'll uh, strictly block it. Audit, it will post something in the audit log. And warn, it will actually fire a warning message back to the user stating that, hey, this is in violation of this policy and you might want to do something about it, but it will allow it to be created. So you can actually get uh, user feedback. If you define a non-compliant resource with Enforce, you'll actually get an error message back via kubectl that says this policy has been violated. Okay, so just remember those three. Sorry, water break. Okay. Okay, in addition, and I'll show you how to do this with labels on a namespace, you can pin policy. So for each version of Kubernetes, there will be changes to the pod security standards. Why is this important? Because if it changes over time and you're not familiar with those changes and you upgrade Kubernetes, you might break your workload. So this allows you to pin, much like everybody pins all their version dependencies and software, right? Oh, bad joke, sorry. Too soon, too soon. But you can pin the specific versions. Pin the specific versions allows you to have consistent behavior. You can say, baseline colon latest, you can say baseline colon v1.22 and that will apply because remember this is built into Kubernetes so you can strictly version pin. Okay, so let's get on to enabling pod security and how we might go about doing that. So, 123, it's enabled by default because beta features are actually enabled by default. So you can use this on any 1.23 cluster out of the box. Uh, if you're on 1.22, you'll need to set a feature flag on the API server to actually allow this feature to be created. Um, so if you don't have access to the uh, flags that get run on the API server, you might have to wait. You could also take the option down the bottom, which the third bullet, which is you can deploy a webhook admission, uh, admission controller. Mouthful for me at this time of the day. Um, and you can deploy that on versions uh, one dot lower than 1.22 if you want to test this out. Now, I had to put the disclaimer here as we're going through the galaxy, don't test this in production, no, no, no. You might get uh, unexpected uh, outcomes. So get familiar with it in a development setting, a lab cluster, spin it up on kind, start seeing how it works before you turn it on. I don't want anybody calling me saying, Lockie, you told me to do this and I blew up prod. Don't want to hear it. Okay, you've been warned. Okay, configuring. So these are the two labels that you need to apply to a namespace. So you have the pod-security.kubernetes.io slash mode. What are the three modes? Excellent, yeah, you got them all. Enforce, warn, and audit. They are the three modes. So. That is required specifically to enable it. The second one there is version pinning, which is completely optional. There is, so if you say, hey, Lockie, I don't want our users defining pod security policies or labels on namespaces. No, 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 I can't have that. There is an admission configuration uh, way that you can do it by setting a config file and actually having the API server pick it up so that users don't configure anything. So there is a way to do that, and there's a way to do regexing, excluding namespaces, um, so you can do that. Um, so as I've got the star down there at the bottom. So possible modes there again, enforce, audit, warn. These are important. Okay, configuring. 
So the specific version can be applied for the enforcement mode. Why would we do this? We have, remember, warn, audit, um, and uh, what's the other one? Enforce, exactly, thank you. So you usually start with warn, give the users back warning, um, and then you move on from warn to enforce. So uh, this is, you might be able to warn on one level and enforce on another. For example, you might want to move from privileged to baseline, so privileged to baseline, so you might enforce on privileged, but warn on baseline so that you can actually help the workloads that are currently deployed move up. So the users will actually get a warning message, their workloads will still be deployed, but you can say, hey, you're not in compliance, fix it so you don't get this warning message, they're actionable, I'll show you. And then you can move from privileged up to baseline and then even subsequently up to restricted. We good so far, everyone? Up in the rafters? Good, see thumbs up, excellent. Okay, we're gonna go into some demos in a minute. So uh, what I wanted to show you is what actually an audit piece looks like without filtering through an audit log. So if you have audit logging on your cluster, you will see a message that looks like this. So this one says, allow privilege escalation does not equal false for the container busy box. It must be set in the security context, allow privilege escalation eats false unrestricted capabilities. So there's a bunch of errors there. You can put them in audit logs and people looking at audit logs can actually see where things have been fired. I will also show you that we publish a set of metrics uh, that you could scrape with Prometheus to see which policies are indeed uh, being hit, how often they're being hit, so that you can see from your monitoring tool how it's operating as well. So I'll show you that. Okay, from here, we're gonna show you it in action. And, and by the way, I got all these images from the free and public NASA images site. They have wonderful uh, images of space. That is the Hubble telescope, uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at how this works. So I'm gonna walk through some different um, examples here with you. Um, and what I'm gonna do is demonstrate. Don't worry about this. There is a blog specifically where you can reconstruct these whole demos by yourself. All the commands are published. So you'll be able to take this uh, from a Kubernetes blog and run the exact same thing. So for this first demo, we're gonna confirm specifically that pod security is enabled because you wanna make sure if you're going through all this work that you're actually doing it on a cluster that uh, has the feature enabled. So I'm gonna kick this off here. Let's see if it, if it does on my click. There we go, okay. So I kind of walk through the demo here in the top half of my VS code I have the script that I'm gonna run with some comments about what you should see, and down the bottom half, I have a, a live and running cluster. So I'm just gonna show you that I indeed have a 1.23.5 cluster here that's up and running. So there's no, you know, I'm not pulling a rabbit out of a hat, it's all up and running. Um, and you're gonna see that there are some nodes on that cluster as well. In the blog, we actually show you uh, how to uh, run this up with Kind. So I'm actually using a Kind cluster. If you don't know Kind, check it out. It's a great tool for testing out these features and running with them. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this to check that if it's enabled, I'm actually going to check the API server flags. If you do not have access to the API server flags, you cannot run this. This will not work, but you can run this command and specifically I'll go and highlight it in that big list of different admission controllers that pod security is indeed present in that list. That means pod security is indeed enabled on this cluster and that I can use this feature. Now I'm gonna quick, quickly show you a, a quick dry run where you can actually test if it's working as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a namespace. The reason why you'd run this is if you don't have access to the API for, uh, server flags. I'm gonna go through this. We created a namespace. What do we have to do with the namespace to turn this on? Anybody? Label it. I'm gonna label it. So here I'm gonna label it with enforce equals restricted. So I'm running that command now and then I'm gonna actually just show you the YAML of that specific namespace called verify-pod-security. Just to prove that that label is indeed there, I'll go and highlight it and you can see it there in the list that that is uh, applied to that specific namespace. So what we're gonna do here is um, actually do an interesting command. So if you don't know this one, it's a fun one to test. We're gonna do um, a run. So we're gonna run test with the image busy box, but we're actually gonna do a dash dash dry run equals server. So I'm gonna try to apply this 
and it violates the policy, and I actually get an error back that it's forbidden because it violates pod security policy restricted colon latest. So uh, because of these reasons. So there are many reasons there in that list that this workload violates that policy. But that's just a great way for you to test that it's running. You apply a restricted to a test namespace and then actually try to dry run, create a workload on the cluster. So dry, dry run server is something I use all the time to test the capabilities without actually having to run a workload. Okay, so that's the end of this first demo. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page about checking that it was indeed on in their cluster because I know not everybody is running 1.24. Is there anybody running 1.24? Yes. I've got a prize for you. Okay, yeah, no, excellent. So I know it's relatively modern 1.23, 1.24. Um, so you need to check that it's indeed uh, enabled. Now we're actually going to go through what it looks like to apply some policy, then create a workload that violates that policy, then try to bring it into compliance. Okay, sound good? Excellent, thank you. All right, I'll kick this one off. So we're going to apply, create a privileged level, uh, enforce on privileged, and create a workload. So again, I'm going to create the namespace uh, verify-pod-security. That's indeed created. Going to label the namespace with the dash dash overwrite because I didn't clean up the labels from last time on this test cluster. And we're going to enforce on restricted and we're going to audit on restricted. Okay, so we're getting the hang of this now, right? Everybody knows what we need to do to turn this on. And now we're going to take a privileged workload um, and deploy it to the namespace. We expect this to be forbidden. Why do we expect this to be forbidden? Because I have in this pod security context allow privilege escalation equals true. And that violates the restricted policy. So we're going to go and use this pod specification and apply it to the Kubernetes cluster. And what we should expect is an error back. And indeed, we get an error for the pod busybox privilege. Forbidden violates uh, allow privilege escalation does not equal false. So again, a useful error message for your users. They can understand that. They can see exactly what they need to do to fix that. Um, but that will not be created because we're enforcing on restricted. OK, I'm going to go ahead and actually update it to say we're enforcing on privileged. We're warning on baseline, as I said, and auditing on baseline. So we actually have mixed mode there across enforce, warn, and audit. And as I said, this is a great way to enforce and make uh, users move, help users move to baseline. OK, so I'm going to deploy this privileged workload. Um, and then we're going to check if it's running. So do we all think it'll run this time? Yes, OK, let's see, let's see. Cue the Jeopardy music. OK, it is indeed created because we actually uh, set the uh, privileged policy. So we're allowed to have privileged escalation. Is privileged escalation great in pods? No, it's not. OK, so I'm going to run some cleanup here. And now we're going to work through more complex on restricted uh, workloads so that you can see exactly how you might be able to clean them up and look at them. You can see that it's running, even though in the brackets at the top, I say that it will not be running on the node. But you can see the pods running because um, you can actually schedule to the control plane node on, um, on kind by default. OK, so I've cleaned up. That's a privileged work level workload. Now we're going to move on to a restricted level uh, and workload. So let's take a look at this one, and then we go and have a look at some metrics. OK, so again, create the namespace. OK, now we apply the labels to the namespace. What we're doing this time is enforcing on restricted. Last time we enforced on privileged. They we're enforcing on restricted and auditing on restricted. So we're going to deploy uh, a restricted workload in this namespace. And you're going to see a little different behavior this time, which is, is really interesting. OK, so here's our uh, restricted pod. And we actually have a security context with allowed privilege escalation false. And we add a capability net bind service, which if you look up in the pod security standards, I should be able to do that under the restricted pod security standard. So I expect that to be OK, but let's, let's see what happens. OK, it is forbidden. Why is it forbidden? Unrestricted capabilities. What does unrestricted capabilities mean? 
you actually have to explicitly set fields in the pod specification when using the restricted. You cannot infer that default values are compliant. So you have to explicitly set in this case that error. I need to drop all the capabilities. If I don't explicitly put that in my pod specification, I will not be compliant. So here I am, I'm dropping all the capabilities, capabilities all specifically, and adding the net bind. So again, I think I've addressed this as, as a user, but this is interesting with the restricted policy. It does not allow you to use default values that are computed server side. It wants them to be upfront. So that is indeed created, and we are great there. Now I want to go through one other use case here, which I think is really interesting. Um, Check out the pod. The pod is stuck in container create config error. What's going on? It passed the policy. I thought we were good. I don't know what's going on. So what I'm going to do is go and describe the pod in my normal cube control debug. We have a really interesting error message here that we can take a look. Error. Container has non run as non root and image as root. So only when we execute the container do we actually see that it wants to run as root. And we can't have any containers running as root, right? No, no, no. So now that we've seen that, we can actually go and fix this up. And what we need to do is actually set in the pod specification that the pod cannot run as root. Again, this is getting the pod security best practices out there and allowing you to have a safer uh, operating environment for your workload. So I'm specifically setting to the runners user 65.534. Um, so this pod will now not be executed as root in the uh, container namespace, or the pod namespace, I should say. So again, we're going to go ahead and create this now that I've set it to run as a non-root user. It's created, and I'll go check. I'll do a uh, get pod and make sure the pod is running. Hopefully, it's running this time. Excellent. So there we can actually see it'll actually be blocked as the pod's trying to execute because it violates the policy by running as root. Okay, we're going to clean up there. One more demo quickly. This is how I'm going to show you the metric endpoints so that you can go grab them. I'm actually using cube, uh, cube control get dash dash raw slash metrics, but you could have Prometheus scrape these metrics endpoints. And we're going to grab pod underscore security underscore evaluations underscore total. Now, why this is important is you can light this up in your monitoring dashboard and actually see hey, what have I got? I've got a mode of enforce set, uh, policy level set to privilege latest on this specific namespace, and we can see that's been hit 17 times. So you can actually light this up in your Prometheus or any of your monitoring dashboards and know where all your violations are happening or where all the uh, allows are happening. So this is just a great way to light it up, and you can actually see externally without trawling through audit logs exactly what's going on here. Okay. That good? You feel confident? Cool. That's, that sounds pretty confident to me. Okay, next steps. So as I said, what are you going to walk away with here as we round up? Okay, go experiment. I want everybody to start playing with this. Understand it. It's not scary. It wasn't scary for me, and it's, hopefully it's not scary for you. Uh, use warn and audit on existing namespaces. And there is a really, really cool trick. You might say to me, hey, Lockie, I have clusters everywhere. There is stuff everywhere. How could I possibly turn this on? That sub point, you can use dry run to evaluate all the violations of all the workloads that are currently in a namespace when you apply the label enforce. So when you do label enforce on a namespace that has a bunch of pods, you will actually get an evaluation and say, all these pods violate that policy. If you run dry run, it's not going to action it. You're not going to apply the label, but you have a list that you can burn down on a specific namespace to bring all those workloads back into compliance. So this isn't just something you turn on in a brand new cluster and figure it out. You actually have some tools to go and introspect and safely use it on clusters that already have a bunch of workloads to deploy. Okay, I always say, you know, general set warn to the same level as a force because that helps you get some uh, user, user feedback and make a goal. So you want to you wanna start at privileged and you want to work to baseline. You want to make sure that all your namespaces are at least at baseline and then selectively figure out which workloads could run to it restricted. Think you got it? Okay, I feel like I'm leaving everybody in good hands. 
This time next year, I don't want to see a talk at KubeCon saying how pod security ruined my life and Lockie ruined my life. But if it is, I'll sit in the front row and listen. Okay, I just want to say thank you for coming on this journey through pod security with me. So now it's handed over to you. So long and thanks for all the fish. And I do want to thank uh, Bridget, Tim, and Jim for their review. Thank you very much. Enjoy your KubeCon. Booth crawl. I'll be hanging around outside here. If anybody has any specific questions, I'd be happy to talk to you and answer them. But uh, you can come find me. I'll be here all week. Thank you.